Okay, so uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity to, to present this, this work. I'm going to speak on behalf of the Joint Physics uh, Analysis Center. And I'm going to be, I mean, this is going to be quite a different uh, talk from the, from the previous ones because I'm going to talk about deep learning exotic hadrons. I'm, I'm going to talk about how we can use machine learning to try to, to understand things about line, line shapes. And it's very nice that during the, the morning, uh, people have been talking about uh, bound states and virtual states and line shapes and how can we distinguish uh, both, uh, or how, what shape they have. So actually this, this, this talk uh, hits that topic uh, uh, completely. And I, I hope you, you enjoy it. So the first thing is, what is the standard approach to, to line shapes? So usually what you do is you, you assume a model and you assume that your model is true. You assume that your model is nature. And then you feed the data using typically a chi-score or something like that. You extract the model parameters, you get pole positions, and you compute uncertainties. That's the standard approach. And then you assess the probability that those data were generated by your model. That's what, that's what you do. And that's what usually p-values are going to, to tell you or the, the value of the, of the chi-square per degree of freedom, of freedom. If everything is fine, I mean, you get a good description of the data, a reasonable uh, chi-square, you usually can claim that the interpretation embedded in your model is a possible explanation for the data. That's, that's what you can do. And you can do it with different models and with different underlying dynamics. And this is actually that, that happens. And the question is, well, how do I compare models? That's something that, but it's very difficult. There are techniques, there are ways to do this, but it's difficult to, to really truly really compare two models when both of them are assuming that they are nature. So it's, it's not like the same that if you were actually uh, considering that the data are, are true and then you are comparing the, the models with the, with the chi-square. It's, it's quite a, it's a bit different. This is an example because this is the one I'm going to, I'm going to use as a, as a benchmark case. So for instance, if you think about the PC4 to C12, uh, you have one explanation of it that is just uh, explain. Well, it's just, it, this state, lay, this signal lays exactly below the sigma C plus D bar zero threshold. And one possible interpretation is to think it's a, it's a molecule and you, and assuming that you can get a very good uh, description of the data. And in another work, uh, you, Actually, we obtained in JPEG, we obtained that it was a, the most likely possibility was uh, that it was a, a virtual state. You can also, uh, also explain it with a double triangle, triangle uh, singularity uh, if you, with complex uh, couplings in the Lagrangian. And for instance, LHCB uh, in, the, in the paper where the PC4212 was, was reported, they tried a, a single triangle and they were able to reproduce the data if the width of one of the exchange particles inside the triangle was very, very narrow, which was deemed as, as unphysical. That's why you usually say that, well, a single triangle can be ruled out because it doesn't really explain the, the signal the moment that you put a, a physical, physical width. So you have different options. So, and all of them reproduce the data. So do we have a way to compare them? Do we have a way to, to, to disentangle which one is the, the, the one that, uh, that, that can do this? So, um, and, the question we asked ourselves in JPEG is, okay, can, can we use machine learning that is now uh, being a big, big thing in, in, in science, can, can help us? Actually, there has been first explorations of deep neural networks as classifiers. I, I, I will say what these things are for Hadron spectroscopy by the group, the group uh, by Sombillo et al. They have several very interesting papers. But we ask ourselves a very specific question. So, we ask ourselves, can we train a neural network to analyze a line shape and get as a result, what is the probability of each possible dynamical explanation? That's the question we were asking ourselves. So it means to take the data and simultaneously analyze the different options. And if possible, can we gain any other information? Because machine learning techniques, there are a lot of them. So there are, there are a lot of things that you can do once you have uh, applied uh, neural network to, to, to data. There are a lot of things you can do. So can we try to exploit that? We are really st still far away from answering those questions, but we are advancing and we're getting ideas. And, and the first thing we did was to take the line shape of the PC4312 and try to analyze it with this kind of, of techniques in a very limited way to do, to be, to be honest. It's not 
full answer. This is just a benchmark to see if it is worth moving forward with these ideas and trying to answer this, this question. So the outlook of what I'm going to show in this talk, I'm going to talk first about the standard approach to the PC 4312. And by a standard approach, I mean what we did in, 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 this, in, the, in, in, in this paper. I'm going to tell you what these deep neural networks are, what these classifiers are, what it means. We're going to apply it to this case, and we're going to see how we can gain additional information through something that are uh, sub-values. So the first thing is you have this data. This, this will come from LHCB and depth website proton projection data. And then we are going to focus on the sigma C plus diversity of price. Okay, where the signal appears. We are going to assume that only one part of it contributes. The threshold is responsible for the dynamics and the other singularities are irrelevant. Under those assumptions, you can actually write this, the reaction in this way. You can write this like a lambda V zero K plus the scattering. I mean, you use crossing symmetry and you can just build a, the amplitude as a two to two process where you have a production. And then you have also uh, like a rescattering of the side proton. So you can basically write the, the events, but it's phase space times some amplitude square plus a background. And then, well, this amplitude is just, this is a polynomial times an amplitude that is defined by this. And we are considering two channels, the JPC proton channel where we see the signal and the sigma C plus divar zero uh, open, threshold opening. And these matrix elements, these M's can be tailor expanded. They are singularity free. So this is tailor expansion. So if you, if you buy the assumptions that I just made, this is essentially modeling independent. And if you use, uh, the, you set the CIJs equal to zero, you are just doing the scattering net approximation which gives you an amplitude that is free of uh, poles in the complex plane of the first Riemann sheet. And it's going to give you poles that can be either in the second or the fourth Riemann sheet and can be like a virtual state or, or a bound state. So it's really simple. And it's something that we can work with as a benchmark model. So this is just the, the, the Riemann sheet structures. This is the, the I mean, the, the T matrix. And you can see this is the first threshold First, the first Riemann sheet, and then you can see second Riemann sheet. This is the second threshold where it appears. And then you can see the first Riemann sheet connects with the third. And well, this is the Riemann sheet structure, which is it's important for our for our classification. And here, here you can see a depiction of how they are connected to, to each other. So this is another picture. Actually, there was a similar picture uh, this morning that I think uh, Fengu uh, showed. So this is the, the purple line is the physical axis. So these are the four Riemann sheets. This is the threshold. And then, with this amplitude, we have four possibilities. Um, you have the possibility that you have a bound state in the four Riemann sheet, is what I'm representing here with this orange dot. It can be a virtual state in the four Riemann sheet, it can be a bound state in the second Riemann sheet, or it can be a virtual state in the second Riemann sheet. The good thing of this model is that everything depends, well, everything, sorry, the interpretation depends on one single parameter, the sign of that parameter. Depending on the sign, if you turn off the imaginary part of your amplitude, you're basically getting a pole either in the real axis of the, or other in, in this axis, getting a bound state, or you get it in this axis, getting a, a virtual state interpretation. So it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. And well, when we did this uh, standard approach, we just fitted the data. We obtained a pole that it was, this minus sign means uh, for Riemann sheet, and this is the error bar analysis. So basically we were getting a bit of state on the four Riemann sheet. So when I apply the neural network to this data using this kind of approach, don't be surprised that I'm going to get exactly the same results because it's actually what I am after. I'm after of benchmarking and thinking if it's possible to use neural networks in, in the future to do real, real analysis. So the first idea is you have to think of neural networks as classifiers, what does this mean? Well, the first thing you have, you're going to build a training set. So this is an example with pictures. So imagine you have pictures of dogs, cats, rats, and pigs. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to train your network. The network knows the answer that is fitted to uh, all the pictures that you, you have, and you have given the right pictures. And then you feed the network with a new picture, and it's going to come up with probability that it's a dog, a cat, a rat, or a pig. And if your network is good and it has been properly trained, it's expected to identify the, the picture properly. Of course, if I put the picture of a human person, it, you're going to get garbage. 
I mean, you are not going to get any, any anything sensible. So what you train your network with limits what your network can give you. And that's important. So it really follows the, princip the principle of garbage in, garbage out. So we built a very simple net neural network, but actually we use, it's, uh, it's, it's just a, an input layer that contains the 65 experimental data points. These are the, the LHV data. We built two hidden layers, 400 and 200 neurons, and an output layer that are the four classes, are the four possibilities. As I said, bound second, bound in the four women sheet, virtual in the second women sheet, virtual in the four women sheets. And then the output layer, you can assign probabilities using something called the softmax function. And this was implemented with PyTorch. In, in the paper that we have everything, we have supplemental material where we describe uh, the neural network in, in detail. The interesting thing is that then you have to build a training set. And to do that, we are going to use the amplitude that I just described, which we know the physics. So we can basically compute 10 to the five training curves that are generated randomly by choosing the values of the parameters. And so you start generating line shapes, one after another. And for each line shape, of course, you can compute the pole position and you can, you know the sign of the N22 parameter. So you do know in what class it is. On top of that, we, to mimic uncertainties, we added a 5% noise included in the training set. And actually you can see on the right, you can see that uh, <clears throat> how the accuracy of the network identifying during the training, so identifying if I plug in a B2, what's the, what well, actually you have here, what's the, this is for 5% noise. What's the probability that it, it, it uh, well, how accurate is the, the network identifying properly the, the state? So, of course, the line shapes are going to be convoluted with the experimental resolution. And here we can see that actually the, the experimental uncertainty, the noise is going to uh, limit the accuracy of the, of the neural network. So that's uh, something that we, we see here. But the neural network does a pretty good job with a 5% error, which is, sorry, noise that is similar to what LHV data have, you, it does a pretty, pretty nice uh, job uh, identifying uh, the correct uh, category. So the next thing we wanted to do is, okay, so now let's apply the neural network to the data. So we have trained our neural network. We have seen that it works for the training set. And now we take the LHCB data. There are two data sets. There's a full data set. There's one data set cutting the mass of the KM proton system, and then one that is the, the weighted one. So then we pass the whole, the, the, all the, the, the 65 data points through our neural network. And actually to account for us, so with one neural network, we can use the three data sets. In the standard approach, you'll have to fit your model to each one of the, of, of the data sets. Here, it's just one single neural network. You pass your, your data points through a neural network and you get an answer in terms of probability. As I said, of course, you're going to get the probability of being each one of the categories for one pass. So what we did was to do a bootstrap. Also, there are two ways to account for intensities. We did a bootstrap on the experimental data, and that's why we get this uh, probability distributions. And you can see we get a virtual form, which is uh, not surprising. But you're gaining more information. You can see here a probability distribution to get the, this virtual form, and you can get a probability distribution to get inbound in the second room sheet or virtual in the second room sheet. That's the bootstrap. The dropout is basically uh, you can, in the neural network, you can decide to turn off certain nodes of the network, set them to zero, and in that way you can mimic uh, some, uh, uh, <coughs> some uh, sorry, some Gaussian noise. The reason why we did this is because the, the bootstrap is something that we do a, a lot in our standard approach uh, to feed data, and it's, it's very clear for, for physicists, but people who are in the machine learning business, they do a lot this dropout uh, technique. So it was a good idea to have a comparison between both of them. And so this is, um, as I said, this, this we recovered the, the previous result as expected, but we are learning more things because we are we're having these distributions that we wouldn't have in the case of just doing the, the, standard, the standard approach. Because in the standard approach, you get one single answer. I mean, you are testing, you're going to get it's virtual, it's bound and it's in this room and shit. Here you are getting uh, what's the probability of being each one of the categories. You are studying the four classes in like simultaneously and assigning probabilities to, to, to them. 
So what else do we get from the DNN? Well, the DNN, what it's doing is it's targeting specific regions of, regions of the parameter space that yield stable solutions. And these regions can be difficult to reach during an optimization uh, or might require very high resolution data. So that's an advantage because if you have less resolution uh, in the data in situations where the standard chi score is not going to give you a very good fit, here you're going to get a, probably a better answer, of course, in terms of, of probabilities. And that also helps uh, because these neural networks are more stable than, than, than a chi score fit. They're going to, a small change in the input can induce large change in parameter values and the physics interpretation, but this neural network, because of it's based on probability, they are a bit more stable. And there's another thing, I think this is an advantage, is that rather than testing a single model hypothesis as a chi-square fit group, the DNN determines probabilities of each one of the classes of interest given the experimental uncertainties. Okay, so what is doing, you're basically teaching the neural network how the line shape of a bound state in the second Riemann ship looks like. That's what you do. And you're teaching how every possible line shape looks like. And you're letting the neural network decide what is the line shape that looks more like the, the data. That's, that's what you're doing. But there's more you can do. And actually, as I said, there are a bunch of uh, statistical techniques uh, available in the machine learning world. And this is one that is commonly used. It's called the subtly additive explanation, the sub values. And these are very interesting because uh, for people in machine learning, the what we are using as input data are what is usually called uh, features. And then uh, the classification are the, are the classes. So for each feature, which is each one of these data points, the subtly values can tell you in what direction that feature is pulling, pulling the, is pushing the explanation. So, it's, so for instance, let's take these, these data points here, these three data points. So positive means it's pushing into that explanation, negative, it's pushing against. So you can see that these three data points, they are pushing in favor of the red, which is the virtual four, and it's pushing against, clearly against the virtual two or the bound, uh, the bound in, in the secondary machine. But for example, you can see that these data points here, they are actually uh, pushing the neural network to decide, decide in favor of a bound state in the second Riemann ship, or even a virtual state in the second Riemann ship, but it's pushing against having a virtual state in the fourth, fourth Riemann ship. So you get a more complete picture on the data, on how the data are helping, are making you, are, are making a decision. I mean, how are you making a decision on, on, on what the data are? And, and this, is, this can be helpful to decide uh, where you need more accuracy in the data, which kind of, of data can be more interesting, especially if we reach a point where we are starting to combine uh, data from different reactions, it's going to tell you where it is worth to measure with more accuracy on, and, and things like that. So, so you're getting additional information that you wouldn't get uh, from a chi-square because it's given you probabilities, it's analyzing the four cases simultaneously. That's, a, that's one of the advantages. So, and this, this is my last, a slide. Uh, my takeaways, the, the takeaways that I, I want to, to give you is that deep neural networks open a new possibilities to answer the question on the underlying nature of a given response. So it gives you also the possibility of to get physics insight on how the data impact the obtained interpretation. But keep in mind, DNN does not substitute the standard approach. They are complementary. We still want the amplitude and we still want the pole position. We want the mass and the width. And, and the neural network is not giving you that information. Just keep in mind. Right now, it's not giving you that information. Maybe in the future, there are ideas to do that, but so far, no. And it allows a true comparison of interpretation. So the big objective, I mean, and I'm dreaming here. This is not going to happen in the next couple of years. I can imagine to train a neural network with every amplitude possibility that we can think of. And then it's going to return the probability that it's one of the possible interpretations can explain the data. And actually, it will give you probabilities. So you will be comparing, truly comparing, different models and different interpretations. We are right now in uncharted territory, so we are taking baby steps. It's, this is a simple example that we have under control. And we just, uh, well, it's, it's in the archive. And we are hopefully just in the beginning of using these, these, these techniques. And that's all I have. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. I see questions from Biplex. 
Hi, yeah, okay. this is a bit long. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. So this is uh, just just to be sure. Uh, so uh, your training data set are these models, but with specific parameters. Is that true? Yes, yes. So basically, uh, what we are doing it's uh, so you can that so we have you have these parameters that are the M I J, and also the background and the and the, this one. It's a polynomial. These are two polynomials. Specific. And we Monte Carlo them basically to get uh, uh, different options. But specific values of the parameters as well, right? Yes, yes, yes. We are we do we run a Monte Carlo, and we are building sets of parameters and each set of parameters is one of the training curves. So how many parameters did you have for this? You have like 10, 10 to the power five uh, training samples. Two, let me think. One, two, three, one. four, five, seven. Okay, so seven parameters and you have 10 to the power five. I'm just trying to think, I mean, how, and uh, how, I mean, the, the point I'm getting to is that, you know, if you have tons of parameters and if you have to uh, generate these training samples uh, with very fine, uh, how fine can you sort of, you know, quote unquote, bin these parameters when you're generating the, the training samples? Yeah. Yeah, what we did, of course, we didn't allow the parameters to be between minus infinity and plus infinity. So we gave them ranges, a specific ranges where they can vary. So all the physical explanations are, are, are there. Because I mean, you can put parameters here that don't generate a signal. So because they, or they're generating the, the signal far away. So you are not interested in, in, in them. So yeah, but of, co of course that's the, the more parameters you have or the wider the ranges of the parameters, the more, the bigger you need to, to build the training set, of course. Okay, so I, I have some further questions, but uh, I'll, I'll let it pass. We can discuss it later. Okay, thank you. Okay, Hario. Uh, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, can you turn back page 11, please? I have two questions yeah. about the architecture. Uh, the first one is, which architecture of your uh, neural network? I mean, is it feed forward or recurrent neural network? It's, uh, it's if I remember correctly, it's for, forward, backward. To be honest, this is a very, very simple uh, neural network. It's, so we are training it with a forward, backward. Uh, okay, forward. I'm having, I'm having, I'm, we, we are training with, I think, one. 1,000, no, wait, 100 or 1,000 epochs. No, 1,000 epochs, if I remember. Okay, thank you. The second question is, which learning algorithm did you use in your study? Because the output can be changed accordingly. So learning algorithm, you mean, oh, for, okay. It's, we use- For the uh, training process, I mean. Multi-classification, multi, multi uh, what's the name? It's multi-class multi uh, cross entropy is the loss function. Okay, and can you write down it in the chat box uh, if yes, I can. I mean, actually, okay. I it, it's it's written specifically in the in the paper, and we're okay. using the the Adam optimizer to get the 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 notes. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, okay George. Uh, hello, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question is, if I understood correctly. The number of the input nodes here, 65, is coming from the fact that you had actually 65 data points in your data set? Yes, I'm correct? using 65 that are, yeah, it's, it's input yes. is, is a data point. Of course, uh, when I do the training, what I do is that yeah. the beginning of my theory is exactly the same of the experimental data. Okay, so for the eight other data sets, for instance, for other experiments and other curves, is it straightforwardly generalizable? And is it usable, for instance, if you train your model for these 65 inputs, then in principle for other data sets, you would need to train them. For instance, if they have a hundred data points, you would have to do the training again, is that correct? That's, that's a very good question. And to be honest, we don't really know the answer to that question. In principle, this is what it is. And so it will be, okay, the answer would be no right now, but there are techniques like transfer learning. There are things like that. There are a lot of things in machine learning that can be explored. That's why I'm saying we are at the beginning and this is really truly an exploratory thing. So to be honest, 
I hope that would be possible to do, but right now I don't know if it will, it will be possible. Uh, all right, thank you. And one minor question. So as far as I understand, this is a proof of concept and you just did it for this one data set or have you yeah. tried with anything else? No, it's just this. This was just a proof of concept. So that's, okay. we, uh, we did it for the three data sets of this. I mean, so you know that there are three data sets for this LHCP data. We did it for the three of them. That's it. That's what we did, nothing more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Feng Kun. Okay, thanks. Uh, hi, Cesar. That's hi, very Google. interesting talk. Thank you. And uh, my question actually is about your, your amplitude. So yeah. the, uh, 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 you show amplitude, which you write that as P1S would yeah. be polynomial times yes. uh, T11. T11 is drips IP to drips IP. Yes. Specifically. Uh, yeah, here the question comes, as you see in my talk, Actually, T11, uh, if I relate that to the amplitude in, in my talk, that would, has a, that would have a zero in the numerator, which is not polynomial. And then okay. th this zero, actually, if the sigma C D bar instruction is strong, this zero can be close to a threshold. Actually, mm -hmm. this will change the threshold behavior. I'm wondering whether this would be a reason for your result that the uh, PC4312 as a virtual state and our result has PC4312 as bound state because this changes the threshold behavior. Yeah, it might. And actually, yeah, yes, yeah that, that's a very interesting thing. And it, it might change the things. Uh, in this talk, to be honest, I don't care much about the physics. I care about the fact of the, of the, of, of the tool. But uh, an interesting thing would be to take the kind of amplitudes that you have and do the same kind of analysis and maybe combine it with these ones and do, do the neural network. But yeah, it might, it might be, I mean, it might be that using your, your amplitude as you get a different result. And of course, if you're plugging, if, if I were doing this analysis with your uh, amplitude, I will recover your result with a neural network because that will be my benchmark case. Yeah. Okay. I'm not claiming okay. at all at all that this work on neural network reinforces the idea that it's a virtual state. It, yeah, it okay. doesn't because, because it's a benchmark. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Because you had uh, earlier paper that's uh, concluding this is virtual state right? using similar amplitude. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean that I, I want to make clear I'm not this is not I'm sure, not sure, the, sure. the claim that oh wait, it's a virtual state, we win. No, that's that's not what I'm saying. Sure, sure, of course. <laughs> I, I I'm just wondering. Uh, what would be the physical reason between uh, the difference that we, we, we are having now? So that's, uh, I'm, uh, would be very interesting uh, to, uh, to, to know the, uh, the conclusion. Yeah, it would be very nice to do a full comparison. But, uh, okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you, Christoph. Um. Thanks for the nice talk. I understand it's not the physics you care so much about here, but I still have a question regarding the setup of your benchmark calculation. Can you go to page nine, please? Yes. I really don't understand your sheet labels here because you, you see, you show, you show the basically uh, the K2 plane. Yeah. And therefore the only cut that could be there come, must come from the um, JPSI proton channel, which is however far away. So for here predominantly, I should only see two sheets, the upper half being the sheet, the physical sheet with respect to K1 and the lower half being the unphysical yeah. sheet. How do you get to four? I don't understand the labeling here. Okay, because, because the, the, the beginning of the cut is far away from here. So, so this thing is the cut. So probably here you can see it better. This is the JPSI proton threshold, okay? Yes. And uh, the, this, is, this peak is the PC4312. Yes. Okay, and here is the second, well, you can see it here between the first and the third. Here is the Sigma C uh, uh, D bar threshold. So what I'm plotting is just this region here in that figure. So, the beginning of this cut, this is all cut. This is the cut. Why do you change sheets when changing the sign of the real part of K2? So it doesn't make sense to me, I'm sorry. 
the way you mean? show that in that figure, it, it seems that when you change the sign of the real part of K2, you switch from sheet one to sheet two. But yeah. changing from sheet one to sheet two should not be connected to changing the sign of the real part of K2. I don't understand your labels. I'm very sorry. Okay. I mean, it's if you do the calculation to do the numbers. I mean, if you are in, well, if you want to look at the detail in the paper, we provide a full detail on on this structure. But uh, well, maybe that's that's uh, some offline discussion we should have. Yeah, pro probably. Um, I mean, it's just a yeah, yeah. It, it, it looks like a, a, a technicality that the probably that yes. figure is not clear enough. Uh, so and can can you go to page three, please? Page three here. Yeah. Yes, actually, in the lower left, the picture, the picture, the figure that you show indeed uh, is uh, um, apart from from our full analysis. But the reason also why we get the bound state is because we not only fitted the mass range down there, where there might be some issues that Fenkun uh, alluded to compared to uh, what we did. But this is a different amplitude compared to what what Fenkun showed in his talk. But we really fitted the full spectrum. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there yeah, are sure. seven molecules in this thing. Uh, only, well, of the seven, uh, we claim four show up, three are agreed upon by the rest of the community. It's only two parameters. So the system is much constrained by, uh, there are more, there's more structure in the data than parameters available. Therefore, in order to, to um, challenge this, this bound state interpretation, one would really have to look at the full spectrum. Is that feasible in a very general ansatz or would you need uh, really to use, our, but well, if you use our amplitude, as you already said, you will, read, uh, you will get back our answer. Therefore, that's not really that exciting. Therefore, um, what do you think is uh, a feasible approach here? Well, first, first of all, I. No. So, sorry, I, I I didn't want to misrepresent at all the, your, your work and and I understand all those all those differences. This just just was a slide, an introductory slide to, to show that you can have different interpretations of the signal, and we at the end of the day you want everybody to to agree to some, something. Okay, and you are absolutely right. You are fitting way more. Actually, you are. Hello. This is the scheme two of your paper, and you have a scheme three that I think it's uh, it improves. So uh, what we need, and, and the amplitude that I'm using for the square deviable state is only valid in the region near this threshold. So to do a comparison between these two approaches, is, it's, it's not entirely fair, because as you said, you are fitting the whole spectrum, you are putting more physics. This is a very simple, uh, our approach is very, very simple and just reduced to the, to the threshold. Could it be extended to the whole energy range? Well, building a model. Building a model, uh, it's the only way I, I see it. But uh, okay. sorry if I misrepresented in this slide. No, no, no. But you are, because it's, it's, you it was far away from focus. my question. Fair <laughs> enough. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, thank you, Christopher. Thank you, thank you. I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, time is uh, running faster. And uh, we still have two questions. Can we move the two questions to the, to, to the discussion part? Uh, are you okay with this, Dimitri and uh, If they are fast question, maybe they ask now flash question, otherwise we have to do the break and we start the discussion. I think it's better like so. So, Dimitro and Miguel, is fast question or it requires 10 minutes for the answer, you say? <laughs> I think that um, I would like to say that we're still uh, well already too far from the schedule and I think that there is no need to delay even more. I am fine with uh, discussing it later. So what, what do we do? Yeah, do you... Okay, so we do the break do now. you want to move your question? Well, I, 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 I can ask later. It's not a problem. I mean... Okay, thanks. I see Cesar almost every day, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no problem.